gonna, um, I don't know if the teachers are here for our children, but um, we'll go ahead and let them stay until they're called upon. This is Sister Wilson's in the classroom. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Sister Lisa. All right, so welcome to House of Prayer Evangelistic Church Sunday School Hour. Um, for those who are aware, this is our hour where we empower. And it's an hour that strengthens our understanding of God's Word, Sunday School. <laughs> All right, and so with Sunday School, we know that we open the book, the book that matters, and that is the Word of God, the Bible. And we also um, partake of instruction from the seed book, um, which is our Sunday school directive. And it's just moving people from membership to discipleship. And it's a spiritual transformation series that uh, for, for people who are seeking to be mature in Christ, for people who are desiring to grow in the area of discipleship. And this month, our text is talking about um, physical health, discipleship and physical health, and how they correlate, how they relate to one another, working cohesively to get us to a better state of being. Um, we are, our title for the lesson this month is I'm crying, but I don't know why. And I know we may have all had an experience similar to that title where we just cry and we can't really pinpoint why we're crying. Then there are other times when we know why we're crying. Amen. We are very aware of our situation and why we are uh, feeling emotional and feeling like we're succumbing to um, life's challenges. And so our words for this month, I'll just review, are depression, downcast, and meaningless. Depression, a mental illness marked by sadness, inactivity, difficulty in thinking, and concentration. It also affects diet and sleeping habits, feelings of de dejection and hopelessness, and sometimes even, which is uh, a very severe case, suicidal tendencies. Downcast meaning a low spirit or feeling dejected um, or even rejected. Meaningless, lacking any substance or significance. And so we talked about last week how some people suffer in silence until they don't. Silence until they don't. Um, and when I say that, sometimes people go through life suffering in silence, going through life's challenges alone in a, in a mindset of isolation until they don't, until they react to their situations that are happening intrinsically, meaning on the inside. And then we see the extrinsic effects of their internal struggle. And sometimes that can look like rage. Sometimes we got we have coined where one man uh, for about six years, I think, time was going around uh, taking people's lives, and he was uh, he self-proclaimed his name uh, as Sam or something like that, and he went postal, yes. you know. So they got that going postal from him, and then you can suffer in silence. Or individual, <laughs> excuse me, an individual can suffer in silence to the point that they take their own lives and complete suicide. Some people attempt suicide, but some people actually complete suicide. And um, I have had several coworkers who have um, endured that with their children. They, uh, their children have completed suicide. And so it, it has become somewhat personal. What's the challenging part of that is that many of, as educators, you know, they're out here set, serving other people's children and trying to make sure other people's children are thriving and growing while they have lost their own child. And that is a hard uh, pill to swallow. One of the, uh, my coworkers was even, a, is, was, was even a counselor. She since retired. But um, upon her retirement, her, uh, her, young, her youngest boy decided that he didn't, no, her oldest boy, decided that he didn't want to uh, finish life as he knew it. And that's a challenging state to be in. And so we dealt with that and we talked about factors surrounding our experiences with depression or any other health, mental health illness. And sometimes it's ours and then sometimes it's uh, about people who are around us. We uh, become caregivers 
for those who struggle with mental illness. I had a cousin when we first started the church who struggled with mental illness um, tremendously. Um, and it wasn't just the drug abuse. He had served in the military. And so he had a lot of PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. And he had a lot of PTSD, so he would self-medicate instead of, you know, really just adhering to the treatment that was afforded him. And so he ended up, one day he came to the church, and I've told y'all the scenario. He came to the church and he uh, beat on the back door really, really hard. We didn't know what was going on, and so we opened the door. And he came to the altar and we had a bowl, a glass bowl of blessed oil. And he just came to the altar, grabbed the glass bowl of blessed oil, and began to drink it. And we were like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, the only thing we can reduce it to is that he was trying to get rid of those demonic spirits that wow. he was warring with. And he thought that that would be the best way to get the blessed oil. We go get these demons out of us. And it was so funny because we started praying because we thought that was the remedy of helping him feel better or get to a better place. We start praying and laying hands on him and everything. And we got out in the best of you and he said, y'all ain't doing it right. <laughs> and we, uh, <laughs> and we, uh, Sister Marquina Summers and I kind of just looked like, what? <laughs> We're not doing it right. And so, I, I really, that was a moment for me to really understand what the deliverance looks like. And sometimes it's different situations. Sometimes, especially when it's personal, when you have your own personal uh, loved ones who are battling, it might look different. You know, you might not, your first reaction might not be prayer. It might be, I'm going to choke you, girl. No, you know. And so, you know. <laughs> That's the reality, which is, now that's the wrong way. Now that one, that's the wrong way. But sometimes because of the closeness, the familiarity, um, and even the respect factor, we feel like there should be something different happening there. <laughs> and so when it doesn't, we react ir uh, irresponsibly. I have been in that case where I have acted irresponsibly um, out of emotion and um, didn't deal with the mental illness as it really was. We talked about postpartum, which is um, a, a mental health crisis after childbirth, and I expressed that I had endured that uh, myself, which is a very um, challenging state of being when you have a child that you're supposed to be joyful for and loving, and you don't have the ability within yourself because of your mental capacity to embrace that child and love that child. And so you have to go through uh, different different steps to out come out of that state. And postpartum is something that you can, can be rectified. And there are some health challenges that are not as easily rectified. Some people will have to take pills again to wake up and then to go to bed. Some people have to get shots uh, monthly because they cannot manage taking pills every day. And so um, the treatments vary. Counseling and therapy are also great means of support w with those who struggle with depression. Getting in groups of people who are dealing with similar things so that we, you know, you can talk, we can have discussion on what you're going through. Here at House of Prayer, we have um, our bondage breaking, which is a tool used for deliverance. Um, it's a healing ministry that has been set in place by our pastors so that people can deal with whatever they're going through. It doesn't have to be just drug addiction. It can be gambling addiction, which is stems the root cause of the, that is some sort of mental illness um, that um, provokes people to have that, that constant urge or desire to do something repetitiously in that capacity. Um, it can vary. And so in the sobriety support, our, our bondage breaking, that serves as a deliverance portion of our ministry to help people navigate through that area of their lives. Um, in our text today and on, on page 41, I stopped here because we talked about the stigma in society on mental illness and how he, there are people with mental health crisis or mental illness sometimes are undiagnosed. And so they're ostracized because they don't have 
uh, validation, something validating their quote unquote craziness um, or mayhem. But um, so people ostracize and thinking, oh, they just crazy. How many have heard that? Oh, that she just crazy. Yeah. You know, that's what I thought of my cousin who came and beat down the door and came in and drank the blessed I was like, oh, he crazy. <laughs> you know, but I had to learn his history. I learned that he served in the military and because of the post-traumatic stress, it did send his life in a spiraling effect and he was in a whirlwind and a crisis. And even today, right now, he's still alive, but he's fighting to live. He's still fighting for his life, um, fighting to live and, and uh, stay with us. And um, But one thing I do know is that he loves God. And so that's the reassuring part. That's the hope. And so um, we'll start here on page 41. It is hope that in this lesson, it can serve to raise awareness about depression as, as a frequently diagnosed clinical disorder. Additionally, mental illness has often been considered a weakness, and those who suffer from mild and severe forms of the disorder are often ostracized. Some of our churches have been slow to recognize that God has made us all. The mental illness occurs in each Christian family, in every church, and if God loves us all equally, then we too must love all people, regardless of their mental illness and health crisis or other disorders. I'm reminded when I first came back to church in my adult life, in my younger life I seen some things transpiring, but I didn't, I wasn't old enough and as aware to be able to understand what was happening. But in my adult life when I came back to church, when someone came off the street who was loud or boisterous or who um, exhibited traits of craziness, they would immediately sick the deacons on them. Get them. Get them out of here. And as I began to grow and mature in my faith, I realized that they too had a place in the house of God. And it wasn't our job to just put them out unless they were a violent threat against the people who were in the house. But our job was to seek what, what avenues, what, by what means can we help them or assist them. Perhaps they are hangry. You know, and they want something to eat, and they just don't know how to go about coming in the house of God in an orderly fashion to get something to eat. Perhaps they are really battling with some severe mental illness and need someone that they can talk to or dialogue other than themselves. And so what better place other than the hospital, a.k.a. the church, for them to be able to come into to seek the help that they need. This follow, today follows a situation at my son's church where um, his, homeless people try to break in there on a regular. They get in sometimes too, but one man broke in only to get something to eat. He broke the whole glass door so he could get a sandwich. Oh, no. But last night, um, a man was so deranged and so full of demons that he literally snatched the door, the, the bolted door open with, with just force. No crowbars, nothing. Just snatched the door open that was locked, their boat locked, with force. Wow. And went in and destroyed a whole lot of things. And so uh, keep that Paseo in, in your prayers um, as they navigate through these uh, this this time. Yeah. Amen. And, and thank God for a pastor who is young and knows who has resilience and knows how to bounce back and who is very sympathetic to the, or empathetic, excuse me, to those who um, struggle with mental health crisis. Yeah. Um, and so our scriptures, our C, resources for the C, we do have three scriptures. And we'll look at the background of each of these just briefly. But I want to talk about uh, the text. In Job 10, verse 1, it says, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. Here we know up until this point, Job's background was that he started off a, a devout man, very rich, um, very lucrative in his stature, uh, in his social status. He was top class. He was doing the thing. But we know that the enemy decided that he wanted to... Uh, to test Job, to try Job. 
not just to try Job, but to try God. Right. And so we have to look at that as a reality that it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against these principalities. And this is what Job was wrestling against, but he didn't understand the capacity of his wrestle. He didn't understand the capacity of his trial. And so he internalized it. And here we have this text right here in Job 10 where he said, I loathe my very life. He didn't say, I hate the devil. He didn't say, God, why did you have, why are you letting this happen to me? He said, I loathe my very life because why? The condition of his circumstances was situational and it had placed him in a place where he had lost his children. He had lost his livestock. He had lost the faith of his wife. And now he found himself where he was isolated and alone. And then he had these friends that wanted to come and tell him how it was supposed to look or what it was supposed to be like. And he might have just needed an ear and not a voice. And so in this particular section of scripture, in chapter 10, verse 1 of Job, Job made a declaration out of his mouth. He said, this is how I feel, so this is how I'm speaking. And so there are many people who we see, we encounter who are feeling some way internal and when they are in proximity of people, close proximity of others, they begin to voice outwardly how they're feeling. Have anybody ever been in a situation where you've been in a room and you heard somebody talking but it wasn't nobody with them? Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes self-talk is good, but sometimes self-talk can be scary. Right. We have a little boy at my school, I will not say his name, um, because I don't want a lawsuit if somebody hears it. There's a little boy at our school who walks down the halls uh, making profanities and telling people he's going to kill them and all kind of other stuff and talking about demons and devils. And, um, and I knew from the very the onset of his arrival that he had demonic oppression, um, possession. Let me say it right, possession. And um, so I began to, when I would encounter him, because sometimes they would call on me, I would lay hands on him. Um, and if you wonder why you're in a certain atmosphere that maybe is not what you're qualified for or maybe is not what your skill set is, but you are in that environment, perhaps God has called you there to invoke change or enforce change in the atmosphere. And for this little fella, I know that I have been placed strategically to um, lay hands on him. And I often think, you know, I got me a little rambunctious person. He's not walking through the halls cussing nobody out and telling him he's going to kill him. But he's very hyper and very doesn't have spatial boundaries. And so he gets hands laid on him too. Um, and so I will see the manifestation of, the, of my, my declarations for his life. And so will you. And um, so with this little boy at school, I began to see him coming out of stages and you can literally see the transition from when he's in a manic state to when he's in a more calm state. So that's another form of, of illness is manic depression or manic anxieties. And so he has those manic anxieties or manic depression um, which comes out forcefully where he'll throw chairs or where he'll throw himself on the ground or where, where he will make threats uh, vocally. And so we have to, and a lot of the teachers, you know, the, the other teachers are scared of yeah. that. Yeah. I'd be like, little boy. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, and, and so you know, they, that one teacher said, so, Miss Trina, did you just say little boy? I said, yes, ma'am, mm -hmm. I did. And he sat down because he knows you can tell authority right. when it happens. I don't care what state you're in. You know when authority is in the room. And when we take our rightful, righteous authority, we see the manifestation of it. Sister Alice has her hand. Yeah, listening to you talk, I remember when I was uh, a member of God in Star Baptist Church. And one Sunday morning, one of the queens back then was one of the older queens. He busted in the, in the door of the church mm -hmm. and he went all the way down to the pulpit, eyes big, and he stopped and he started looking all around. A few people got scared, but all of a sudden everybody just started praying. Yeah. And while he was standing there, everybody was just praying. He turned around, he looked, 
Turn around, turn around and went right on back out the Absolutely. Because everybody just started praying out loud. Because when we meet aggression with aggression, that turns that devil up. That lets the devil know that we are not in the spirit. It yes. lets the devil immediately know that they are not in the spirit. And so when we start doing it the right way, just like my cousin who was in a manic state at that moment, and he had sense enough, even though we were praying in the vestibule, we had walked into the vestibule area, he told us, Y'all not doing it right, but we were able to find out his need. He said, my feet are cold and I'm hungry. So I gave him my socks on my feet and, and made sure that he was warm. And we went and gave him some stew. He said, I don't want that. Well, if you're hungry, this is what you get. <laughs> and so um, we were able to meet the need once he came out of that manic state. But had we not been praying, had we say, deacons, get him, sick him. He could have turned up a whole nother uh, level and right. threw them deacons like the, the uh, right. them demons did the sons of Sceva right. and, and Acts. And so, you know, anything can happen. And one time we had a woman who was demonically influenced and she peed in the church right on the floor, right there. Yeah. Right there. And so, so many things have transpired <laughs> to, show, to show us that, demi that uh, right. mental illness is real. Yes, yes. Um, we had another young lady who is no longer in the land of the living, but I loved her dearly in spite of her condition, um, who came to the church and she wanted us to help her, but when we took her in the restroom to try to clean her up because she was so filthy, um, she tried to get about it. <laughs> and one of the sisters was like, she trying to help you, but I'll fight you. <laughs> and, then, you know, and it was kind of funny. It was kind of hilarious. And um, she moved me out the way like, no, nah, this tree. And I said, she not, she not going to do anything. It's not that kind of funny. You know, and so we kind of got her to where she was all right to, enough, cleaned up enough to take her on out. But, you know, sometimes people who are under mental illness, uh, the stronghold, strong grip, a mental illness just literally want to feel better. They want to stop wrestling with those internal spirits that they don't know how to uh, get through or, or cause to subside. Look at this text in uh, Psalm 42 and 6. In Psalm 42 and 6 it says, My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon. Now in this particular um, sect of scripture, it's attributed to the sons of Korah. And if you uh, recall the, the re recall Korah in the, um, in the book of Numbers chapter 16, Korah w was Moses' cousin who revolted against yeah. <laughs> Moses because he didn't agree with how things were transpiring. There's always going to be somebody who thinks differently, right. differently than the leader and wants to do it their way. Well, in this case, they served as notice that you could be swallowed in a hole by an earthquake. Be careful what you do. Amen. Amen. So in this particular sect of scriptures, Korah and those his descendants were uh, swallow up and um, and into a hole, an earthquake because of their rebellion. And I don't know, I did not go and study in depth enough to know if this uh, psalm preceded their being swallowing, swallowed up or if this preceded just afterwards and descendants later. I, I'm struggling to understand that, so I will be coming back to you, to us, with that information. Um, but anyway, it's attributed to the sons of Korah, who said, my soul is downcast within me. And it could have been proceeding because what it sounds like is they, that they were recalling a time when things were better, when things were greater. And so when I looked up, um, oh my God, my soul is cast down, it brought up the fact that it might be impossible for me to lighten the load that I'm under, the distress that I'm under right now. I'm full of discouragement, notwithstanding I labor to hope in thee. So what that psalmist was saying is I'm struggling to keep my confidence in you. Excuse me, you all. I'm struggling to keep my confidence in you, God. And so um, it goes on, therefore, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan. So it sounds like the, the psalmist is recalling a time when things were better. 
And how many of us have ever been in a place where we feel like things were better at a certain time in our life than they are now? If anybody feels uh, liberty to share that today, the floor is open to you. I'll yield the floor to you. Go ahead, Brother Kevin. Uh, you know when you first come to God, uh, mm -hmm. you got things going on. And you come to God and it seems like you start suffering. Mm -hmm. And the enemy will tell you, well, you had it better oh. when I was doing out there. Oh, that's and you have to overcome that them thoughts, because the enemy will come to you that way. Now I try to do right. You're not hustling, me. I'm not hustling. Okay. And I'm going through financial things, and my mind is like, man, when I was out there doing my thing, you was making it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I'm suffering, and that's a trip of the enemy. It comes to everybody like that. If you're not wise and never mature enough, you'll go for the enemy. Scheme. The plots and schemes and tactics and what the enemy won't remind you of is that when you was hustling, you was looking over your shoulder That's worried right. about your friends getting you. Right. He won't That's remind right. you of none of that. He makes it all look beautiful right. because you're in a crisis right now when you're in a crisis right now. Thank you for sharing that. That was a wonderful story um, about how when we thought things were better. Um, and then when we look at this, it talks about, that is when it talks about in the land of, of the Jordan, that's from Judea, which is um, the chief river in the country. We know the, the river of Jordan, many miracles transpired there, and they were able to see great things happen. And so when it talks about um, in Hermon, Mount Hermon, in the heights of Hermon, Hermon was used um, in its plurality, because it has a double ridge joining at an angle and rising in many summits. It has great peaks, many peaks. Um, summit meaning the top part. And the River Jordan and the mountains of Hermon were the most striking features. This, this uh, commentary alludes to the scenic view of uh, Hermon, Mount Hermon, or from Mount Hermon to the Jordan River and how it's beautiful. So when you uh, have, if you've ever heard somebody who is going through a crisis and their therapist might say, go to your happy place. Yeah. I mean, your physical body might not be able to go there, but in your mind, you can think about your happy place. For me, my happy place is on the beach. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> With the sun just hitting the water right there where it's hitting the water. And the breeze blowing and the waves coming. I'm in my happy place. Y'all be coming. <laughs> and the waves crescendo and down, you know, on the, on the beach. And I'm close enough where the waves don't hit me, but I can feel just the water just kind of splashing. <laughs> Are y'all there with me? Yeah. <laughs> That's my happy place. Anybody else want to share your happy place as vividly as I did? <laughs> Brother Kevin, you well, back there? I was on the on. Enterprise, and I'm on the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that night, the light was, you could really see the store, the st all the stars. Oh, yes. I mean, it just, I mean, you got to know it's a God. And, uh, it's a good place to just think and pray and yeah. how awesome God is. Yes. And that big, that ocean, uh, everywhere you see is nothing but water. That's it. Nothing but water. And just, you just got to know. Water. And then the move is so, everything is so pure out there. You could, I used to go on the flight there, but everybody in, in there playing dominoes, I go to the flight there and just listen. And one day I had a bucket right here <laughs> and it was filled with water mm -hmm. and the lord spoke to me he said you see that bucket i'm thinking yeah and it was filled he said you see this water mm -hmm. he said how deep you think it is mm -hmm. he said you see this see how wide you think it is and the lord spoke to me he said this is my mind and said that's your mind it just blew me away mm -hmm. that little butter was filled but that ocean was so wide and so deep, and that's nothing I could see but water. And he really spoke to me. I was on that, on that ship, and it just, it amazed me how great 
God is. Yes, the reflection of who God is is so powerful. Thank you for that analogy that your, your mind is the bucket yeah. and his mind is the ocean. <laughs> yes, right. That is so beautiful. And his mind is so vast. And so we, under, we, we have to try to understand like God understands how to navigate through this life, even in its challenges. Our last scripture is, so I hated life in Ecclesiastes 2.17. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun is grievous to me. All of it is meaningless as chasing after the wind. Uh, here, the psalmist, um, the, the writer Solomon is just expressing, he's examining life and how the destiny of his le legacy and the intrinsic value that he thought about might not be the same as though as it is to those he left it to. Oh Jesus. That's the thought when you don't work and toil all these years and went and cleaned snotty nose and went, you know, all this other stuff. Oh, cast demons out of kids in the hallway. And when you don't went and did all this to earn your little coins. And so you can buy and make sure you have a nice dwelling place and then you think about who you live and who am I going to leave this to and how are they going to treat it when I leave it. Oh my God. Think about it, y'all. Stop it. <laughs> I told y'all about my grandma's neighborhood that was filled with doctors and lawyers and all of the, the mid middle class people when I was a little girl. It was filled with very esteemed, well-esteemed Dr. Alexander, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Taylor Farrell, mm -hmm. Dr. Crothers, um, on and on, uh, Sherman Jones, Senate, yeah. in the Senate. All of those, when I was a little girl, we used to look up to them so much, but when I look at many of their houses now, their children didn't want them. Right. They, they right. were like, no, this doesn't matter to me. And go. so some of them let them go, and some of them um, just sold it because they thought, oh, I want something better. And so um, when you leave your inheritance, Solomon is pondering this thought. And it's kind of making him feel some kind of way. <laughs> like, what they going to do with my stuff? <laughs> well, you know, he said all of it's meaningless as chasing after the wind. No matter how hard the wind blows, you can never catch it. Um, you only know that it leaves, leaves a result that it was present. That's right. No matter what it does, no matter what you do, you can never chase the wind. And that's how it is with inheritances. Um, that's how it is with um, just leaving tangible possession. You don't, you, you don't know what's going to happen to it once you leave. Um, you, you can't be responsible for that. You can only hope and desire that those that it's left to will be responsible with it. In our nurturing the seed, I'm going to go ahead and conclude here, get ready to conclude here. It says, what do you mean when you say we have the blues? Having the blues, saying you have the blues is an idiom. Everybody say idiom. idiom. It's an idiom that does not mean that you are blue. You have the blues. You're not just all dressed in blue. You're not blue on the inside uh, physically. But it's an idiom that supposes that you are sad inside. In Psalm 42 and 6, the concept is described as a spirit that is downcast and saddened within us, making our lives challenging beyond our ability to cope. This kind of sadness is not as serious as other diagnosed forms of depression, and yet it's hard for many people to ask for help. This kind of situational sadness can occur in response to specific life events, such as uh, death of a loved one, job loss, relationship losses, and illness. I'll, I'll give you a scenario. This past week, I have wondered, Lord, why am I still at this job? I know that my, my calling <laughs> is something different than where I am. And he reminded me of that because I encountered a young boy who constantly gets in trouble at school. He kind of remind, he, he reminds me of my JoJo who is hype and, you know, just likes to be up close and personal to people. But he has the most loving spirit ever. He's the most loving little boy ever. And his teacher deplores him. And I can tell. And it's a sad situation. So anyway, make a long story short, she was talking to me about the situation and how she was feeling about the situation. Never mind how he's feeling or what he's going through. 
She was telling me how she felt. I said, well, have you talked to the mom? Well, the mom won't come up to the school. She won't do this. She won't do that. Okay. Have you been to her house? Well, no. I said, okay. I said, so I made up in my mind today after school when they walk home, I'm walking home with them. And that's what I did. I went to their home. I said, go get your mama. I did say it just like that. Go get your mama. <laughs> and they went in the house and they got their mother. She came out and she was nervous and I could tell she was on that cigarette. She was on it. <laughs> and I let her have it. And usually I'll be like, hey, you put that out because I can't handle cigarette smoke, but I let her have that moment. Yeah. Um, and I told her some positives about the boys and then I dealt with the issue. And then I looked around and I observed what we were doing what was happening around me. I'm a little too observant sometimes, but I noticed a cord was coming from her house to the downstairs to the club. No lights. And so I began to understand that for a child, it's traumatic when their basic needs are not met. On Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if their basic needs are not met, they, it, the chances of them progressing to the next tier of Maslow's hierarchy is almost impossible. Yeah. And so I had to say, what are we going to do here? So I knew resources in the community, and so I gave them to her. Um, and I told her, you need to come to the school because they need to know that you are present. They need to know that he has an advocate other than me because I'm going to advocate for him. When I feel like he's being mistreated, I'm going to be his advocate. But they need an advocate more than me. They need to know that you're present in these children's life. And she said to me, I'll be there tomorrow. And she kept her word and came to the school. And because of that, she was. we were able to find out, or I was able to find out, that she had greater deficits in her life, mentally, emotionally, and financially, that needed to be met. Had I not gone the extra mile, the trauma in her children's life, could have kept her perpetuating. And it went on to find out that she was, because she didn't have her utilities, she could not stay in her, her place, which would have created a greater level of trauma for those children. So the church, we decided to be the church good, and help that family. Right. And so thank God for all of you who are in position to sow into the kingdom of God so that we can meet moments like that for people who are in a mental health crisis, who are in a life crisis, who don't have enough. Y'all did that. Y'all did that. Y'all took that family and that mother of six children from a place of trauma and frustration and not even knowing where to begin to a place where she had a hand, not a hand out, but a hand up. Amen. And that's what God is calling us as the church to be for those who are in mental health crisis, those who are dealing with traumatic life events, sobriety support, bondage breaking is not a hand out. It's a hand up. It's a held hand up from the place of uh, violence within, that internal violence that people struggle with within, to a place of healing, a place of deliverance. That's what we are. I'm going to conclude here with this last few sentences, and then we'll go into our um, sharing. Chronic depression and most mental illnesses can also be triggered by such events. But a biochemical in nature, or biochemical in nature, typically responding well to treatment. Without help from friends, family, spiritual guides, and professional therapists, people often hate life. That is evident to the rest of the world through their destructive and distressed behaviors. This lesson couldn't have been more timely for me because, as you all know, I do care for some, more than someone, some ones who have mental health issues diagnosed, <clears throat> not, <clears throat> not just um, undiagnosed, but diagnosed individuals who struggle with mental health. And as I said, sometimes because of familiarity, I don't get it right. Sometimes I'll be like, you know what you want to do? <laughs> and so pray for me that I, you know, can maintain that level of wisdom and spiritual self-control and discipline so that I will do it the right way. Um, this is a very real lesson. We all have somebody we know in our family who is struggling with mental health crisis. How we approach it and how we handle it 
makes all the difference in the world. What I suggest is that we start going on YouTube if we don't have a counselor ourselves, because sometimes those who help it, people need a counselor, honey. Let me tell you. And so instead of um, instead of us just going along trying to figure it out, get on YouTube and look for videos of therapists who are willing to share resources and tools to help navigate through caring for people who have mental health uh, challenges. And so that's how I'm going to conclude today. And Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would, Lord, bless us with wisdom and understanding and knowledge, God, on how to, to receive a community, Lord God, that is riddled with mental health crisis. It's not just in our churches, not just in our home, but it's throughout our community, in our homeless community. God, we ask that you would give us the wisdom to help navigate and help them with a hand up and not just a hand out, God, so that they'll learn how to fish and not just want to take a fish. God, we thank you right now for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I yield the